Thanks for being here, folks. Uh, and maybe we'll just uh, kick off uh, for Tony and Ditya and, and, and Lucas. You know, maybe just talk about pre-gen AI. Let's just, this word is so overused, but pre-gen AI, what are your components on your ML stack look like? And post-gen AI, what are some of the biggest changes from a high-level perspective? Yeah, um, let's see. So pre-gen AI, we um, had trained our own customer-specific and uh, vector embedding model. Um, and so this was BERT and BERT-like technologies. Um, we were relying a lot on open search or elastic uh, retrieval. And so this, this was doing, um, th this was how we do our search. We, of course, you know, had all the NLP and how we parse queries and, 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 and structure, uh, do stemming and all of that. Um, and uh, what, what, really, what really changed uh, when we hit Gen AI is like Glean, you know, instead of, instead of being able to search across all the information in your com company, all the unstructured, unstructured information in your company, and give you 10 blue links, kind of like a Google for your company, all of a sudden it became, you know, give you a direct answer to that. So it was kind of, uh, you know, the introduction of LLMs was like, get that reasoning piece on top of it, where we could leverage those things that we've, we, we've built there, and, um, you know, now give you, that, give you that direct piece of information um, that we have. So that's, a, that's in a nutshell, I could go, could go more into it. You know, I think one other thing that's different is there was a lot of emphasis pre-Gen AI on data pre-processing, feature engineering, trying to get more out of the data before you got to the machine learning model. And with transformer architectures, a lot of that feature engineering is now more intrinsic to the training itself. So you would tokenize your data, and then you would train the model, and then you would have some of those same insights and feature engineering in the training process. So we saw a shift where a lot of teams that were focusing on data pre-processing pipelines, augmentation, are now focusing more on training and inference. And then the second one is on the inference stack. You know, it used to be a lot more straightforward. You had a model artifact, you put it in a model server, you deployed it. Now you're thinking about um, GPU capacity, vector database retrieval during inference, caching prompts and caching context uh, for conversational use cases. So I think training and inference have taken on more of that load, where maybe pre-gen AI that was more in data pipelines from some of the customers that have been doing this on SageMaker. Yeah, so I mean, we see a similar thing to what Aditya was saying. Obviously, we sell um, an ML app stack to thousands of enterprises. and. Pre-gen AI, there's, there's like kind of a data set component of tracking your data. There's kind of a data lineage component. There's a model registry and, and a model component, and then a production monitoring piece. And I think in a gen AI world, you see all those same components, but what they look like is very different. For example, you know, the experiments that you might run when you're training a model might be changing hyperparameters or changing the input data, whereas when you're using a gen AI model, it's often kind of changing the prompt or changing the data that feeds into the model or even changing the underlying LLM that you're using itself. Yep. Cool. Maybe, Lucas, uh, it's a good segue, because I'm sure a lot of the audience or their board or CEOs are telling them to find a gen AI strategy, somehow embed gen AI in their product. Where do they start? Where should folks start? What are some of the key considerations? You know, should I go and you know, buy an API from one of the large language models? Should I build this myself? What are some of the key high-level considerations? Well, I think what's amazing about Gen AI is it's unbelievably easy to try. So I think there's kind of no excuse for going off and making like a big plan before you get started um, tinkering with it. I mean, I always feel like with any project, it's better to get a prototype working end to end before you make any assumptions about what could happen. And that's just like 10x true in Gen AI, where it's, it's so hard to tell a priori what's likely to work, what's likely to not work. But you can mock these things up and actually see how well they're going to work um, with, with almost no trouble. So, that would be, that'd be absolutely the place I would start. You know, the, the other thing is your company's probably already using foundation models, like unofficially tinkering side projects. So I think one of the, the useful things I've seen is just go and find out what people are already doing. And many folks would have found interesting problems to solve. They would be building prototypes and POCs. And then some of those are going to be valuable, and then you can really put some uh, resources behind that and, and make it into an actual project or initiative. 
Yeah, I'd maybe add the kind of the, you know, I guess a, a lot of companies, the very first choice is like use an, AI, use an API or, or um, use one of the open models. Mm -hmm. And I'll just mention that we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time benchmarking our, our, our kind of our reasoning step, you know, where we're using the LLMs, um, using manual eval and other things on our workloads. And uh, the quality gap is so big between the, the closed and the open source models. You see a lot of things on these leaderboards. Like I think, you know, like Falcon took over last week or something. And like, you, you know, they, they seem to get closer and closer. But there's, there's all these kind of effects where if you're using, if you're using GPT-4 to do these evaluations of the other models, you might find the one that's most similar to that rather than the best quality. Right. And so we've, re we've just really seen a, um, you know, that, that gap is still real between the closed and the open models. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is, th this has led us actually to to want to um, you know, th there would be a lot of benefits to being able to 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 run your own models, but it, it's led us to um, want to make sure that we're using the absolute best quality there. No, absolutely. I think I really agree with that. It's also you need to think about evaluation for your company and use case. So the benchmarks that you know OpenAI, Anthropic, Cohere, Google, everyone uses are very general and broad. So they're trying to come up with models that can succeed at a very wide range of tasks. Most likely, you don't need to cover all of those bases. Right? So you don't need a model that can like, write poetry, do physics, pass the bar, and write code, and like 50,000 other things. You probably have a more narrow domain. So one of the really useful steps that we've seen customers take is define what that eval criteria and data set looks like for their domain and use case and then use that to evaluate the models. Maybe in that narrow domain, the gap is not so big. This is a great point. And perhaps talk about narrow domains. Um, you know, most of folks here probably at some point they'll think about fine tuning, right? They'll think about other components on the stack and they might spin up a vector DB or they might do, you know, racks around in context learning and whatnot. Any thoughts around fine tuning in general and what do you encourage folks to do? And, Maybe even at what threshold, right? Should you just start thinking about fine tuning? Is it a day one thing? Is it you know later on? Well, I think the the answer to that actually changes as the technology changes. You know, I think that um, you know before GPT four launched, there wasn't maybe quite as big a gap between the open source models and the um, the closed source models, and there you know fine tuning might matter more. And then as open source models maybe catch up with GPT-4, again, because those are much, much easier to fine tune and, and much cheaper to fine tune than GPT-4, puts more pressure on fine tuning. So I think fine tuning almost always improves the models to some extent. But unfortunately, the best models right now are incredibly expensive to fine tune to the point where you probably don't want to do it. And so I feel like the answer to that question around fine tuning changes day by day. The only thing I would say is you never need to start with fine tuning. Right, like you should always try the model without fine tuning first, and then fine tuning if you can do it will only improve your performance. And, and I think it's important to remember that fine tuning is also training. Like fundamentally, you're just starting from a different in, initialized set of weights. You still need to deal with some of the complexity of training. You still need to have the right data. Um, and so, to, to Lucas's point, your starting point is probably going to be in context learning with an existing model, and then you might find that this is not good enough, I've tried different models, and, and then maybe I'd use fine tuning. The, the other quick one to add is, I think there's two dimensions um, I found useful thinking about fine tuning. One is, do you have data that's constantly changing? So if you're trying to bring new tasks or concepts in, and they're kind of static, you can fine tune that once, and maybe now you've got a model that, that understands that domain specific information. But if you're trying to get you know, stock price information or something that's really changing daily, then retrieval through some IR system is going to work a lot better than fine tuning. And the second dimension is um, just you know, how much data you have. And a lot of companies that want to do domain adaptation don't have the, the labeled data sets, so the RLHF, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback pipelines that can support that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point about retrieval augmented generation. So, I mean, what, really what we're talking about here is domain adaptation. And so one way to do that is you get the, 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 the source data into the model itself, and that carries with it all these issues. So one, one is, um, you know, in our context, uh, everybody in a company has access to a different portion of the knowledge in that company. And we want to be able to, to expose all that. So it's not really feasible for us to train a model for every single employee 
And then once you edit one document, you send one message, we'd have to retrain that again. That's again, you know, the, the, it, you know it go, goes on and on where you start to get this combinatorial uh, explosion bow off and you'd have to train and retrain. Um, so we've, we've, had a, we've had a tremendous amount of success, I'd say, with, the, with pairing really, really great information retrieval uh, with the reasoning engine that, that is uh, the, um, the LLM. And with this model, you kind of get, you know, like you said, you get the, you get the, the, the real-time information, it's permissioned, uh, you don't have to worry about the, the security aspects of that if you were to try to, you know, you know, jam all the information in the model and then assume there's some security layer there, which there's not. So, um, I think I think this is a you know it's a it's a technique worth uh, definitely worth considering in this in this space. Cool. And there are a couple sort of emerging techniques or disciplines around you know Gen AI that wasn't here before Gen AI, right? Like prompt engineering. I know Lucas, you guys have a new prompt engineering product or or uh, you know chaining, right? Like chain different models and whatnot. Uh, any any quick thoughts on the on those things that emerge as a result of Gen AI? Well, again, this stuff changes day by day. I don't know how many of you have actually tried chaining a model or building. I'm just curious with the audience. Has anyone used this stuff? Um, so, I mean, I, I have to say, when I started using these models, I was personally shocked by things that work. For example, we were trying to do a SQL generation application, and so we'd ask the model, "Okay, here's my question. Can you write some SQL?" It wasn't working, so we added a step that's like, "Hey, could you debug the SQL that you just wrote?" So that's a kind of chaining, incredibly effective, actually, for us. It's hard for me to believe that in a, a technique like that has a long shelf life. It sort of seems like probably people will figure out a way to include that or make a prompt that um, includes that. But certainly, right now, almost every production application that we see at Weights and Biases includes quite a lot of chaining. So, so asking the uh, LLM model one question, then asking a follow-up question based on the answer to that question, and then again and again and again. The problem is that creates quite a lot of complexity, and there's quite a lot of trouble debugging these models. So I'm not sure chaining is such a good thing, but it seems core to making models actually work in production right now at this moment, 2023, <laughs> June. <laughs> 3 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think chaining can also create um, operational complexity in terms of, you know, where what are your failure modes and where did the failure occur? In many cases, you know, you won't be able to replicate that exact sequence, um, and so it just creates that combinatorial problem. But it is effective, as Lucas was saying. So you know, we'll expect to see it, but I think we haven't quite figured out the operational design to support that kind of um, deployment. Yeah, prompt engineering. Uh, I, I do think I do think we've seen as the models, the foundation models, have gotten better and better. That you have to do less of the kind of spell casting, yeah. the, the black magic sort of things. And I think we'll continue to see that. So I think I think there might be might be maybe too much hype around around like prompt engineer as a JD or something. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like for us, the the one of the the, the roles or things that we saw um, become much more important was just manual evaluation. Um, it, it, evaluation is one of the one of the really big problems we have, and and uh, it's really hard to replace a human with domain expertise in the in the type of content that you have. Um, running the you know being able to evaluate the quality of that and make sure you're making the right decisions on, the, on those. I guess one reason that I do think prompt engineering might be here to stay though is the last company they ran was called Crowdflower, a data labeling company, and um, this was asking human beings to do similar tasks to what we now ask LLMs to do. And it was very hard to even ask a human a question clearly enough the first time to get an answer that was useful. Mm -hmm. So actually accurately expressing what you want in clear language is a, a real skill and probably will be necessary to use these models effectively. That's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I do want to come back to the model itself, but let's shift gear a little bit, talking about personnel and, and you know, obviously, uh, if you're a bigger company, you're now hiring the head of Gen AI. But uh, for, no. for a startup, <laughs> uh, for startup, you know, what should people do here? You know, like there's a lot of developers, right? Should they repurpose the team, um, with existing team, developer team, just go into AI with some function that's focused on you know, data science, evaluation, monitoring, and all that? Is that the right way to do it? Should they hire dedicated personnel to do this? Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, I can talk from Glean's perspective yeah. at least. I can say, you know, I think, you know, depending on how core this is to your business, you should absolutely have the team, you know. So and maybe Tony talk about like how many people you have on the R&D side, how many are focused, I mean obviously Glean. Yeah, absolutely, so Glean has so, about yeah. 120 engineers or so, you know, 10 to 12 on our, our central intelligence team. And it, it's interesting, one of the things is that it used to be that like our feature teams and our intelligence teams were kind of very separate and they would, they would you know, partner at an API level kind of on things. And now what we've seen is this, this kind of democratization, like Lucas was saying earlier, where this is very hackable, anybody can pick this up, like generalist engineers can figure out how to build this into the product. We've seen that our, our product teams can take things a certain level. Um, it, it, becomes, it becomes, I think, you know, the name of the game here is as the LMs themselves are like getting, getting uh, commoditized to a degree, it becomes really important to build, build the, you know, that product experience to, to really figure out how you're adding value to your users in a way that has good, good UX. And that's something that the feature teams themselves understand best or best at. They can take that and what we're doing while we still have, you know, a central team is when it gets to a certain point, then, then that team can, can optimize that thing and really, really take it and own it once, once, once we have that. So for us, li a little bit of a hybrid, but more of a shift to democratization. Yeah, I think there's also an element of the labor market dynamics of which skill sets you're trying to build. Um, if you're trying to train your own models and you need some of the best AI scientists on the team, you probably won't be able to hire everyone you need to decentralize and embed them into every single individual product and engineering team. Um, but if you're doing you know, more like prompt chaining and just using off-the-shelf models, then maybe you can hire in that particular labor market to decentralize. And this can shift as the, the technology changes, as kind of the labor market dynamics change, you might find you have more options to, to decentralize. But we've seen at least some of our customers centralize for a very simple reason that they don't have enough machine learning scientists to decentralize. Well, I guess, you know, we've, I've, I've been selling to ML teams for 20 years, and we kind of like a centralized function because it's one place to sell into. But, Honestly, it always strikes me as a little bit of a bad idea because I feel like the most common failure mode of ML teams is they do something that's not really relevant to the rest of the company. So that would always scare me. And, and I feel like with Gen AI, there might be more of an opportunity to decentralize the people working on ML because it's so much easier to get value out of these algorithms. Like, for example, we're, you know, we're a relatively small company compared to the audience here. I think we're you know, a little over 200 people, 100 engineers. But we always do every year, we do a hackathon where we work on ML projects. We make every engineer work on an ML project really to build empathy with the customer. And you know, the last couple of years we've done it, the ML projects are kind of interesting, but you know, we would never really deploy them into a product. And then this year, we did an LLM only hackathon. And it was wild because every single team of engineers in a week was actually able to make something using LLMs that we really wanted in our product. It really seemed like it had a path to possibly deploying in our product. So that just made me think that getting value out of LLMs for the average software developer is so much easier than with ML that maybe we're going to enter a world where teams um, decentralize more. I'll just note this reminds me of the platform discussion this morning a little bit where, um, you know, when you have different teams solving the same problems and then you start to see them solve it in different ways, um, then maybe there's some, some benefit in that centralization. And so, it, yeah, cer certainly the way we've been looking at it is like there comes a point in the problem uh, it, where, where, where you need that additional level of quality and that, uh, you know, improvement that benefits, thinking about it like a platform layer, I think, improvement that benefits all the feature teams. Totally. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you can shift gear a little bit more into, you know, folks, things that folks f are fearful about, right? Security breach, privacy, what if an employee put some data on ChatGPT and somehow it got leaked? Uh, how do you put guardrails around this, whether it's through a central team or through some sort of enforcement, right, in the organization? How do you guys think about it? I can speak from one of the things we see right now in, on AWS and SageMaker is a lot of customers are looking for ways to deploy uh, foundation models in their accounts inside VPCs. And even if it's a proprietary model, um, you know, one of the reasons we built certain services in, in Bedrock and SageMaker is so that an enterprise customer can say, I'm going to use you know, Anthropic's model or AI21's model but it's going to live in my account. So Anthropic and Cohere and AI21 never see 
my data or my prompts, and that just stays within my VPC. That's been a really um, powerful table stakes requirement that enterprises came to us with, and, and once we satisfied that, they were able to kind of scale and, and be a little bit more adventurous in trying models from different providers, and hitting the endpoints that were hosted by someone else was where they had a lot of these anxieties. Anything else, Jack? Um, I'm mean, going to say this question is so broad, and there's so many possible problems here. <laughs> I'll just maybe point to one, which is uh, which is evaluation of these models is a, is a huge problem. And and I was talking to um, the CEO of Replit publicly in a, in a on a stage like this, and I was asking him how he did testing, and he was like, "The only way we do testing is something we call testing by vibes." <laughs> and I just thought, "Wow, <laughs> this is like a, the product that millions of people use, and you release new versions just by testing by vibes, which is what it sounds like, where they just intuitively try it." And use it. I don't feel bad sharing this publicly because he said it publicly, but that just showed me that the, the state of the art of evaluation is a very low bar right now. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we get consistent quality out of LMs in production. There were some wild stories about um, evaluation scores that change radically if you remove trailing spaces um, or if you have multiple choice and you remove like the parentheses around A, B, C you get you know, huge swings in, in accuracy. So I completely agree. The evaluation is really poorly defined right now. Yeah, the, the security one's definitely a, definitely a really interesting thing. I think it was just in the past couple of weeks, OWASP put out their, their first top 10 list for LLMs, right? Um, and the top ones are, are uh, you know, probably not surprisingly, prompt injection and data leakage. Um, and you know, the, 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 the real key thing is that Anything that's in your prompt, anything that 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 your model was trained on, there's no there's no security barrier around that. Um, it's an it's an important thing to to keep in mind. Also, yeah, for us, when I think of biggest challenges, e evaluation and how we do that consistently and iteration. You know, it's a real it's a it, you know when when we in in the past it was much more easy much easier for us to have automated eval sets. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we're, go we're going much more manual on that. And what that means is maybe you have to wait overnight to, to you know, as you're iterating on a change, you have to wait overnight to get your, your results back on your eval set rather than getting it back in 20 minutes or so. Um, and so this, this, this is something, you know, I think that some startups, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about in the space and they're like, hey, what can we do for you? What can we, what can we provide? And we're like, yeah, if you, if you can solve eval, um, we'll, we'll buy what you have. Like, if you can give us a better thing here, um, we would love to see that. Cool. I know we're on time, but last last question. It's gonna be a hard one. Okay. Give folks one take, just one, one silver bullet. Whatever you know. One silver bullet. They should That's... go home, and somehow this thing happens. Just one big learning from you guys doing this. What is like one actionable thing that you think folks should take home with? Anybody jumping on it? I don't. I'm not gonna pick somebody. Yeah, I don't know how to tie this up. It's a very broad <laughs> question, but uh, I will say, you know, as you think about this at a company, like, be be on top of this yesterday, not 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 in a week, not later in this in the year. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's 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 best best thing I would say. Cool. A detail. Um, yeah, I don't know. If there's a silver bullet, but I think. Um, be really have a really strong model of the cost on some of these deployments. I think a lot of folks get surprised because when they go to ChatGPT or Claude, those are subsidized heavily. Like you are not paying the inference cost when you give your you know twenty ten dollars a month. So when you actually build your own and deploy it, there's a very different cost structure that you should think carefully about, and there are ways to optimize. And what you do with that inference stack and that training stack correctly or incorrectly can lead to like six to seven X higher costs than you need to pay. So spend a little bit of that time up front modeling that out, thinking of the areas to optimize and, and where you would end up. I guess I would say, I, I don't know all of you, but I am continuously shocked when I talk to execs and my customers that haven't tried GPT-4, Claude, and some of the other LMs. It takes like five seconds to try. It's like the biggest change in tech that's happened in maybe ever. And I think it's, there's no excuse for not being up to speed, at least intuitively, on how these models react and giving it actual questions and seeing what it comes back with. Cool. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you.